Hey, good morning. How are you, everyone? Good morning in here. How is everyone? Happy Friday. It's beautiful. It's Jody here from Abundant Grace Church, uh, live streaming for our Faith and Healing School, number 429. Woo! We are getting up there. So good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, every morning, really. <laughs> Um, so let's open up in prayer. Let's start. Let's start. We got some goodies today. We got some goodies today. We're going to talk about the hindrances of faith. Amen. All right. So Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus as touching this subject, Father, this uh, message, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the amazing, amazing um, privilege Father, to serve you. I empty my own agenda, Father, and I ask you for the anointing, Father, the anointing to preach your word, the anointing that breaks yoke, Father, for everyone who is listening today, Father, and who will listen in the future, Father, that they would receive the things that you have for them today. We give you all the glory, all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so a couple Fridays ago, I've been doing a few Fridays in a row, and we've been talking um, about how faith comes, part one, part two, how faith comes. We've been learning about that, that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Today, we're going to talk about six hindrances of faith. So we, this is Faith and Healing School, so we talk about faith and healing. Um, so faith is the subject of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith or belief, what you believe, what you have faith in, because people have faith in the wrong things, and they usually get it, don't they? Faith, God's faith, is faith that his word, the anointed word, is true. God says that his word shall go forth and not return void means that when you're standing on something on, and you're standing on the word of God, that when you speak it, it will not just bounce off and not produce anything. It will go forth and do what it is called to do, which is could be a whole bunch of things, could be healing, could be restoration, could be, um, you know, uh, prosperity in all aspects. I like the message from um, AGC on Sunday um, that Frank was talking, Pastor Frank was talking about prosperity is full, the full circle. Not when, when, when you talk about prosperity, it's, you know, people go right to money. It's not that. It's completeness, fullness in every aspect of your life. And that is God's will for us to have prosperity. Nothing lacking, nothing broken. So today we're going to talk about six hindrances of faith. And I'm still um, speaking out of uh, Kenneth Hagin's faith uh, study course. So we're taking things from little nuggets from there, little, uh, you know, all scriptural base. It always has to be scripture involved or else it doesn't mean anything. So we're talking about that out of his uh, Bible faith study course. Okay. And I found really some, some really good nuggets in here of truth. All right. So, um, hindrances of faith, there's six hindrances that he talks about. And the Bible talks about, we don't want to put emphasis on one Bible teacher. We talk about the Bible, the gospel, the good news, right? So first Timothy six twelve is our opening scripture. In the Amplified Bible, it says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Well, what does it mean to fight? You know, I'm one who, and I'm, I'm totally transparent. I did not finish high school. You know, I left at 10th grade. So I have learned to look in a dictionary to see what words mean. To, and now, you know, teaching Bible scriptures and Bible uh, courses and stuff now using a concordance. So I have to dig in and I have to just see what these words mean. We think of fighting as like a boxer, fight, 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 or you're in a fight with somebody, you know, you're coming against one another, you're fighting. Husband and wives, fight. <laughs> 
Brother Moore says, it's not a fight, it's a heated discussion. So we've learned to adopt that saying, we're not fighting, we're just having a heated discussion, which is, sounds a little bit better than we're having a fight, you know? So the word of God says to fight the good fight of faith. Well, fight means to contend with an adversary. The concordance says to contend with an adversary. Does that sound familiar? Adversary. What is our, ad, who is our adversary, right? We, we hear it a lot in the word of God. We hear it in uh, church, uh, you know, when we get together for church. We hear that a lot, our adversary. I think uh, when, I, when I read that, it was like, ooh, pop right out of me. An adversary. What are they talking about? Fight the good fight to contend with an adversary. Well, if you're a boxer, you're contending with your opponent, right? That is your adversary. Who is our adversary as a Christian? We talk about it all the time. Satan, right? In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So our adversary in the concordance literally says this, specifically Satan, the arch enemy. I think that was when I read that, I mean, I've read it a thousand times all over the place in the Bible, but when I looked it up this time preparing for this message, it says the arch enemy, which I thought was really cool. That makes, that puts a lot in perspective because it says fight the good fight. Well, okay, with what and with who? You fight the good faith, the fight of good faith, the fight of faith with our arch enemy, Satan. So adversary in the concordance means the arch enemy, our arch enemy, Satan. In the dictionary, if you look Satan up, it says the rebellious angel who in Christian belief, that's us, is the adversary of God and the Lord over evil. So when the word of God says, fight the good fight of faith, we're fighting against the things that he brings to us. We are fighting with the word of God. That is our weapon. We are fighting. We are not fighting the devil himself. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we are only fighting the good fight of faith our beliefs at what we have been taught, what we believe, the word of God. The only fight, the only fight we're required to fight is the fight of faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Everything we do is by faith. We've been talking about this a couple Fridays in a row. Uh, We are established by faith. God operates by faith. Amen? All right, so some people say, you'll hear them say, uh, I'm just going to fight the devil. Well, you, you're not going to fight the devil. He's not going to show up as a human being. He's not going to, you know, you're not going to sit here and you're not going to get in the ring with the devil. And you hear a bunch of, of preachers, and, and I'm going to say it today, that the devil's been around for a very long time. You and I are no match for the devil. He's been here forever. He knows the tricks of the trade, of his trade, of what he, he knows so many things we can't even begin to uh, compare with the devil. Yes, we have authority over the devil. I don't want to get ahead, but we cannot physically combat the devil himself. He is crafty. He's uh, cunning. He is smarter, smarter than us. We don't fight the devil. Amen. But here is why we don't fight the devil. Because Jesus fought the devil. Jesus already took our place. Jesus fought the devil and won. So we don't have to sit there and say, I'm fighting the devil. I'm fighting the devil. One of the things that I hear a lot of people saying, and I know when my father was alive, he used to say, the devil's after me. The devil's after me. I said, Daddy, the devil brings things. But you're, you know, he didn't understand You can't fight the devil with physical fighting. You're not going to stand up to the devil. We combat the devil by uh, the word of God is our weapon. Amen. So we fight the good fight of faith in every area, knowing the truth that Jesus paid for it all. When we get the revelation of Jesus 
on the cross and what he went for and why he did it and he paid it all for us, we have better understanding of fighting the good fight of faith. And it can be a fight at times, standing, believing, confessing, refusing to move off of what we believe. And what we believe is the Bible. We read the Bible, we come to church, we hear the Bible being preached. And what is the Bible? The gospel. We talked about it in the past Fridays and the Friday before, and Friday, two or three Fridays in a row. The gospel is the good news. Well, what is that the good news of? Well, if you're in the Bible, <laughs> you know about the Bible. The good news is, and I love how Brother Moore says it sometimes, the good news is you don't have to be sick anymore. The good news is you don't have to be broke anymore. The good news is you have a good relationships, a good marriage, good, you know, whatever you need. That's good news. That's called the Bible. That's called the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The gospel called the good news. So our news, one of the biggest news that we have is that we have eternal life. The biggest news, the good news, is that our names, us born-again believers, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's good news above everything else. We're saved for eternity. Nothing, nothing could ever snatch us away. When we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we, we, we confess him, right? As the Son of God, we receive salvation. We are his eternally. We are in the God family. We are in the VIP of the VIP. <laughs> we are, there's no other better place to be. And if you don't know Jesus as the Lord over your life, and if you've not received salvation, well, well, we'll you know get to that at the end because there's no better place than to be grafted into the the family of God. There's so much down here, but we have so much more to look forward to. This is nothing down here. If you're living a good life, as we should be, there's nothing compared to what we're going to see when we get to heaven, when it's our time to go. But we have a job to do, church. Okay, so the number, there's six, num six um, reasons. Uh, what is my title here? The hindrances of faith. There's six, okay? Right now we're talking. I'm sure there's more. But number one, a uh, hindrance of faith is the lack of understanding regarding the new creation. What it means to be a new creation in Christ or a new creature, some translations say. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Or we could say creature, depending on which translation you are reading. Old things have passed away. Behold, old thing, all things have become new. So your old self has been gone away with when you received Jesus, when you received salvation, you received a new spirit. On the inside of you, you received a new spirit. All old things, everything has been passed away and erased. The word creation means original formation right the original so when we when god created us he created us into his own image and he's the truth of prosperity right nothing lacking nothing broken perfect 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 he created us in his own image it was when sin came into the world and messed everything up but it says that old things have passed away behold all things all things meaning all things become new do you feel brand new when you get saved no took years took years for me and, and I'm sure everyone else. But a lack of understanding of what the new creation is and what it means to be a new creature can hinder their faith. When you don't understand that you are brand new, that you are new, that you are new creation in Christ and because of Christ, all you may think of is when you become brand new, when you, become, when you receive salvation, you say, okay, great, my sins are forgiven, but that's not it. 
That's not it. Many believers do not think that they are new creatures. They just think God just forgave them, right? When you become born again, you still identify with the old man. But you don't see yourself. You know, you don't see yourself in the new. When you receive salvation, your spirit is renewed. But you still have to walk out this whole life down here. And as you feed on the word of God, as you feed on it, you become a new person because the inner man is working on the outer man. Do you understand what I'm saying? And things start changing. But that's why we tell you to read your Bible, come to church, apply what you're hearing because Everything is changing step by step, faith by faith. You know, like little baby steps. When you're saved, you're that's great. You're going to heaven. You're sealed. Everything. But you still have to walk out your faith. You still have to walk it out. So we are new creations created by God in Christ Jesus with the very life and nature of God in our spirits. So our spirits are recreated brand new. Okay. Romans 8, 17 says we are children of God, sons of God, and heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. How cool is that? <laughs> we have been made a new creation. We are now joint heirs with Jesus. We have to get the revelation that we are not the old person. And it may take time to stop doing the things that we normally would do, but we have to understand that we have become new. We are, we are children of God. We are the sons and daughters of God and joint heirs. Now an heir, what is an heir? An heir to the kingdom is, well, that tells me I belong <laughs> on a different playing field than what I've been, you know, walking out here. Does that make sense? You see yourself differently. Amen? When you know what you have and who you are in Christ, it makes all the difference in the world. Your identity completely changes. It took a while for me to understand what that actually meant because I didn't feel like I was a different person in the beginning when I first started to step out in faith and receive salvation and learn about, you know, what the word of God says. But once I got it, I started acting differently. I started dressing differently. I started talking differently. I started holding my head up high, you know, because I was understanding who I was in Christ and what happened. But it took a while, and it does take a while. That's why it's so important to be committed to the Word of God and praying and reading and, and coming to church. I might say that like 500 more times today. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it took a while. So number two, number two hindrance is a lack of understanding our place in Christ and Christ's place in us. My father and mother, and I don't know if they're, you know, well, my father in faith, and my real father is not watching. Obviously, they're, you know, having a party up there in heaven. But my father and mother in, in the faith, Pastor Aunt Anthony, Anthony <laughs> and Carol here at AGC, they always taught us to go through the epistles in the New Testament that are for us today and pay attention to all the in him scriptures in whom in christ pay attention to them um the word in the word of god is like about 133 to 134 times they say that they reference to in him in whom in christ so reading the scriptures and writing them down will help you understand um what they're talking about who I am in Christ, say, oh, I am that in Christ. Who I am in him, oh, I'm that in Christ. Let me give you an example. Uh, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In whom? Who are they talking about? So that's what I'm saying. When you look at that scripture, you say, well, in whom? In Jesus. We're redeemed. Right? Does that make sense? In whom, and some scriptures say, some translations say, in him. In him we have redemption through his blood. So those are the things that we look for when we read the word of God. In him, in whom, in Christ. When they say that, pay attention, write it down, and then you'll understand. So we could say, 
Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Oh, oh my goodness. I've been redeemed because of what Jesus did. In him, by him, in him, because of him, I've been redeemed. Make sense? All right, we write it down. So remember, we were talking about how faith comes. Faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Are we hearing the word of God? When we write down the scriptures, Ephesians, especially the one we just read, Ephesians 1, 7, right? We write it down in, in him, in whom, in whom? Put it in Jesus, through Jesus, because of Jesus. We are redeemed. And write it, I am redeemed. That's what that scripture means. I am redeemed. Amen? My tea is making noises. <clears throat> so faith for who you are comes by hearing and hearing. Reading the word of God, writing it down, confessing it, living it, and most of all, believing it. What did we say a few weeks ago? Believing is having faith in what you're looking at, your scriptures. Do I believe what this scripture says? You should. The word of God never lies. The word of God, God himself is not a liar. He should, he's not allowed to lie. His word is truth all the time, regardless of what we think of. Okay? So when we read in him, in Christ, Whatever those scriptures are, write them down. This is who I am. So I could say, like I said, I am redeemed because it says, in whom I have redemption. That means I'm redeemed. And there's other scriptures that say I'm redeemed, right? And we, we have some of those scriptures that talk about healing. You know, healing belongs to us. Why? Because I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm redeemed. Number three hindrance to our faith is the lack of understanding our righteousness. Do you have to do everything right to be righteous? Or do you have to do everything right for God to call you righteous? Let me give you the answer, no. <laughs> no. We are made righteous when we receive Jesus into our heart, when we receive him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he has made us. This is uh, the King James Version, so it's like hath. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I, I wish I had like a little bell. <laughs> da, 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 da. Write it down. In him. In him, right? Okay, so we are righteous because of him. In him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you missed that one. So, yeah, those, there's one of the in him scriptures that you might want to go ahead and write it down and remember it. So, in the Old Testament, they used bulls and goats for sacrifices of their sin. For us, we are born again through the blood of Jesus. There is no more goats and bulls and sacrifices laid on the altar. That was the Old Testament. That's how they paid for their sins. Jesus paid the price for our sins so we could be made righteous through the new birth. Amen? We will not be any more righteous than what we are right now. Oh, but I don't feel righteous. What did, you know, look what I did yesterday. Look what I did an hour ago. Oh, I you know, mouthed off to whatever. You know, oh, I did this yesterday. No, it does not matter. This is why we have scriptures that say that we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, right? And that's 1 John 1, 9. We go to the scriptures when we mess up. God knows that we are human down here. He knows when we're going to mess up. He knows everything about us. But faith doesn't operate by feelings, right? I don't feel righteous. I don't feel like it. You know, like I'm brand new. Faith does not operate by feelings. Faith in what Jesus did for us is what we focus on. In him and through him, scriptures say he remembers our sin no more. When we confess our sins, it's like it never happened. We are always righteous. Those of us who believe and have received salvation and the new birth, we have been made the righteousness of God. 
through Christ Jesus. So we could say, and you could say, you can confess, I am righteous. Regardless of what did I, what did I do, I made a mistake, I repent quickly. We are always righteous because of what Jesus did. So we don't have to say, I'm not worthy, I am, uh, I don't feel righteous. No, I am righteous. And when you start playing those head games, when the enemy starts playing the head games with you, well, look what you did, remember this, remember that. No, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That was one of the first things that I got a hold of in the early walk in my, my journey is that I didn't feel, because I had made so many mistakes, and I had lived a certain lifestyle, and when I realized that when I received Jesus into my heart and made him the, the Lord and Savior of my life, and I received salvation, I realized that I had been become righteous. I was in right standing with God. I repented of my sins. And I'm quick to repent if I miss it today. But I am not going to be any more righteous than the day that I received salvation. So we have to get that, you know, right. And we have to understand that you can't work towards any more righteousness. When you receive Jesus, you are made righteous because of him and through him and in him. <laughs> scriptures scriptures amen amen hindrance number four the lack of understanding regarding using the name of jesus i like this one i like this one <clears throat> when we know what the name of jesus will do we can take a rightful position of authority over satan now remember we talked about that in the beginning fighting the good fight over who our adversary, Satan, right? The name of Jesus is a lot of people think that it's just, oh, we'll pray the prayer in the name of Jesus. And that's only one part of the name of Jesus. John 16, 23 says, whoever, whatsoever, sorry, excuse me, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. That's prayer. So when we're coming into prayer and we pray our prayer, we ask God to do something in Jesus' name, that's a prayer. But there's so many more things that we are, you know, we're able to use in the name of Jesus. So Mark 16, 15 through 18 says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it's the same word, creation, okay, to every creature or creation. Verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. <clears throat> Pay attention to this. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, let's just stop there for a second. Believe, that scripture in the concordance also means or has faith or is committed to, right? So, and these signs shall follow them who believe. Believe what? The gospel, the good news, right? The Bible, the, the God's word. Believing that or having faith in that or has, has been committed to that. So, it's important to understand that believers who are committed to the word of God, who act on God's word, who have the uh, belief that they have faith, right? Because faith is what gets the job done. Faith in God's word. So the signs shall follow them that believe or have faith. In my name, they shall cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues, right? Do you remember in the word of God where it says um, these, these men were trying to use uh, in the God that Paul preaches about? You know, they had no idea what, the, what he was even saying, what that meant or anything, and it didn't work for them, right? Uh, this is basically uh, what they're saying with that. In these signs that shall follow them that believe, believe, have faith in what the word of God says. Not just someone who's going to throw 
you know, stuff against the wall to see if it sticks, right? In my name. So us believers, in Jesus' name, we shall and we have the authority to cast out devils. And we shall speak with new tongues. So if there's a believer out there that doesn't believe that speaking in tongues is for today, well, the word of God says that you shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall be, and they shall recover. They shall lay, and it doesn't mean just the preachers, the fivefold ministry, the uh, ones that are evangelists, the ones that are speaking. It doesn't mean just me. It doesn't mean just Pastor Eddie, uh, uh, Melissa, pa you know, Carol. Uh, Miss Gloria, Pastor Frank, it doesn't mean just us who are preaching the word. It means all believers. In, in verse 17, let's back it up. All who believe, and these shall, signs shall follow them that believe or have faith in the gospel, the word of God, the good news. They shall be the ones. Lay hands on the sick. Lay hands on the sick. If you don't believe laying hands on the sick, well, then I don't suggest you do it because that will hurt your faith because you're not there to believe at that, that particular situation. So it says that we shall lay hands on the sick. Have I laid hands on the sick? I gave you an instance with the grandkids and the, the fever. Yes, yes. At, you know, even a, a dog. Laid hands on a dog and the dog recovered out of the, the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit, lay hands on that dog. The dog was sick. And there were witnesses to witness that that dog was in a dying state and that dog <laughs> recovered miraculously. Miraculously. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the situation was. I think that something was perforated inside. And the, a friend of mine was very upset that... The dog was going to die. The, the veterinarian said there was nothing for her that she could do. And literally, the Lord said, lay hands on the dog. And because that dog instantly was healed, the vet said, I don't know what happened, but it's, it's like it never happened. There's no, no cuts, no nothing, no breakage. The dog is healed. It put faith in the person who owned that dog. And was like, what happened? I said, the dog, the, the, God healed your dog. God cares about our things. It's not so insignificant. A dog, you know, uh, whatever, an older person, well, they're on their way out anyway. You know, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're not old. No. Mm -mm. You know what I'm saying? It's not insignificant. The word of God doesn't say, just lay hands on the babies, just lay hands on certain people, just lay hands. No, he says, you shall lay hands on the sick. It doesn't say, you know, but, or, you know, only those are really sick. Oh, you know, no, they shall recover. So in my name, in Jesus's name is not just for a prayer, it's a whole bunch of other things that you can do this. It's not just for preachers. If It's for all believers, believers, sold out to the word of God, believers, committed. Um, even when someone is acting out, and you'll see this a lot, especially nowadays, even when someone is acting out, it is not the person, it's the influence behind the person. So, I've, I've done this too, you know, when I see something in the word of God, I, I act on it because I, I believe the word of God wholeheartedly, heartedly, and I, I'm committed to the word of God. So if someone is acting out, I remember coming home from um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma people were so friendly in the airport. We come home in New Jersey and we pull in and there was a ruckus at like two in the morning at the baggage claim. And I know if anybody's watching this that, that has been there with us, <laughs> they were, there were metaphors flying and it looked like there was going to be a fight broken. It was at two in the morning. And you know what? I just literally, 
I'm not saying because I said it, because I know that I was with praying people. You know, it was getting ugly. So under my breath, I said, Satan, you foul spirit. You stop acting through them right now in the name of Jesus. And like I said, I'm not saying it was because I prayed, because maybe they prayed too. I don't know. It's not like you announce that you're going to pray, or you're going to speak or, you know, things like that. You know, it's what we know to do. So, and within, you know, a few minutes, the situation was diffused. They went their other ways, and we left that place. <laughs> so, I, I heard a story from Jerry Seville, and it really, I remember it. Jerry Seville said that, and he's talking about the authority that we have in the name of Jesus, and he was talking about a time where he was in, uh, or walking on the street or something, like right, wherever he was, and a man, I believe, got hit by a car or something like that, and that guy started seizing in the middle of the street. Well, he went over, and he said, Satan, you stop it right now in the name of Jesus, right? And, and the guy pulled out of the seizure, and he was fine. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. We as believers have authority we don't take authority over people. We take authority over the situation that's happening because it is the enemy that is acting through these people or, or trying to get to these people. So in this situation, it's the enemy that causes this man to start seizing. We, we know about that in the Bible. It talks about, you know, a child seizing or a boy seizing in front of Jesus. Remember that? That is the work of the enemy. So when we see these things, we have to be first responders pretty much and say, no, no, Jesus, you stop. Uh, oh, excuse me. Woo, sorry, Lord. Sorry, Lord. Satan, you stop acting through this person or causing this nonsense. We have that authority. So many believers don't even uh, know about the authority that we have. They just think, oh, pray it prayer, a prayer, and like in the name of Jesus, and that's great, but there's so much more that we need to remember. So when situations happen, you be the one to jump in and say, and of course, you don't have to make a big fuss. Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus to stop acting through that person. You shut up right now. And I'll tell you right now, I use that when we get into a heated discussion for marriages, a heated discussion. I'll go in the bathroom and I say, Satan, you foul thing, you, you stop it right now. Don't you come in here and try to, you know, start this trouble in my marriage. You, I take authority over you right now. You stop it. And it stops. It stops. So we have to remember the authority that we have. It's so important in the name of Jesus. Number five. I like that one, too, in the name of Jesus. That is one of my favorites because it works when you know the authority that you have, it works. Uh, number five, lack of understanding about acting on the word. This is huge. We need to stop trying to make God's work, God's word work, and start acting on the word. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I love this scripture, but a lot of people don't act on this scripture. They just, I'm trying to make God's word work. Well, no, that's not how it goes. In a nutshell, you're stop trying to figure it out. We don't have to try to figure things out. How's it going to work? How's the money going to come? How are they going to get healed? How am I going to get healed? What's going to happen? We overthink so many things. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own thinking. We're not that smart, really. He's so much smarter. He's 10 steps ahead of us. Even if we have a degree, we're not smarter than God. He knows what he's doing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows where you're at. He knows it. So you need to just trust and lean on him that he knows what he's doing. Okay? And he does not bring sickness. You take authority over your own body. Use the word of God. Right? Do everything that you know to do in the natural, and God will take care of the supernatural. All you just have to say, if you have nothing else to say, is, I trust you, Lord. I trust you. Amen? 
So we need to stop trying to make God's word work and just act on like the word is true. Act like the word is true. We read something, by his stripes I'm healed. He redeemed me from the curse. I'm seeing this. So what am I saying? Well, how's it going to work? No, no, no. Stay with the word. Okay, I'm healed. I'm redeemed. I use this over menopause. <laughs> I'm redeemed from menopause. I learned that from Miss Gloria. I'm redeemed from hot flashes. I'm redeemed. I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. Tries to come on. I'm not taking it. The word of God says I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. That Jesus was made a curse for me. So I don't need it. I don't take it. I don't want it. And I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We have to act like the word is true. We have to ask yourself what God says about what you're going through. This, that, whatever he, whatever you're going through. What does the word of God say? Find it in the word of God and act like it's true because it is true. Okay? Everything that we need works like that. So, uh, funny story, and we're almost done here. When um, a few, few, gosh, it seems like forever, but years ago, when um, Frank and I were just married, and so it's going on almost 11 years now, we were living in Homedale, and we were going through some of the toughest times financially. It was just a nightmare. And um, it was Christmas time. And Frank was supposed to get a paycheck, and it was right, you know, Christmas Eve. He was supposed to get the paycheck that day. And... Um, it didn't come. We saw the FedEx guy come. Now we're like, oh my gosh, we have no Christmas presents for the kids. We never really buy each other anything because whatever. We, we, we buy whatever we want anyway, whatever. But, you know, Christmas is for the kids. And we were looking forward to having that. Even it was just like a little something because that's all we had, just a little something. But nothing came. So I said, you know what, Frank, I'm going to, and at that time, he really had a rough time with finances, and it was just a nightmare, like I said. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go to the mailbox, and I'm gonna, maybe it came regular mail instead of FedEx. We see the FedEx truck go by. He didn't stop at the house. I go to the mailbox, open the mailbox up, nothing. So I have my head down. And I said, Lord, you know what? You said in your word you would take care of us. You said that you would provide. I said, Lord, I don't care about Christmas for myself. I said, but you said that you would take care of us. Now, we have a paycheck coming, and it's not here today. But you said that you would provide. And I said, Lord, and I talked to God like this. I said, Lord, are you lying are you lying to me? Because if this doesn't happen, you lie. I said that to him. I walked back from the from the mailbox, because it wasn't one out in front. We lived in a, a townhouse. So I had to walk from the mailbox section and walk to the townhouse. And I'm walking and I'm saying, Lord, I know you're not a liar. I know you're not a liar. I said, Lord, you said you would take care of us. And I picked my head up as I got to the front grass area of the townhouse and the FedEx truck pulls up, and he says, ma'am, do you live here? And I said, yeah. Oh, I forgot to give you this. I was supposed to drop it off like an hour ago, and I, I missed it. It fell in the seats or something. I said, oh, thank you. I walked through the door, and I was like, praise God, we got the check. <laughs> so, but that was just one instance one instant of God just showing up. And we could have just said, you're a liar. This stuff doesn't work. Look at us. We're going down. We have no, I can't pay our bills. And we couldn't pay our bills. Could not pay our bills. Something was happening. God was showing us that he could be faithful and trusted, and he was, and he is, and he always shows up. And even when it doesn't look like in the natural, the FedEx truck is on its way. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. He always comes through, okay? So, which leads me to the last 
hindrance. We have to stand on the word without wavering, okay? Last hindrance, hold fast your confession of faith. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast your confession of our, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waving. This is in the New King James Version. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful all the time. If you don't see it in a McDonald's drive through minute, hold fast because it's coming. Your healing's coming. Your finances are coming. Your prosperity's coming. Restoration's coming. It's coming. You just got to believe it before you see it. So Mark eleven twenty three. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Whatever he says. Faith is measured by what we say. What should we be saying? We should be saying what the word of God says. We should be saying the same thing that God says. If we say what God's word says, we will have what God's word says we can have. If it's in the word of God that I'm healed, then guess what? I'm healed, regardless of the pain, regardless of the headache, regardless of what the doctor, no, God's word trumps it all. If we waver, we, God's word says that we won't receive anything. If we waver, he operates by faith, regardless of how long it takes. One day, let me just read my notes here. I don't want to mess this one up. If we say that God's word works one day and then the next day we say, oh, this must not be working. That's how we lose our faith in the thing that we're believing for. Um, you hear it all the time. It's a perfect example. Sorry, Dad, I, you know that I'm even bringing this up again. But when my father got healed in this church, uh, he got hands laid on him. He walked out of a wheelchair. He didn't have glasses, and he was healed. I have a picture of him standing at the front door. He was healed. He knew he was healed. Everything, he, physical things, he was healed. He walked out of it, came in with oxygen, wheelchair. He walked out of here, stood by the front, and I took a picture. The next day when he was home, he had a little sniffle. He had a little maybe a little breathing uh, thing going on. And he said, pay attention to this. He said, I must not have been healed last night. He said. So we have to be so careful when we receive our healing, our prosperity, our restoration, whatever it is that you're standing for, that we don't negate the word by the next day if something comes up and we say, oh, I guess I didn't get that. No, you're negating the whole, I, the whole thing, the whole receiving by the words of your mouth. Amen? We can't waver. We must obey. We must operate the way God operates, by and through faith, and faith in God's word alone. Faith in God's word alone, regardless of how long it takes, regardless of how it looks, regardless if you stand and you stand Firm and you refuse to go here or there, don't, you know, you're here in church and you believe something and it's getting your spirit all fired up and you say, yes, 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 I believe. And then you go home and something happens and then you say, I don't feel good. Uh, you know, I have an ache or I have this, uh, the doctor, da, da, da. and then you get on the phone with your friends and they say, how are you feeling? Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Just don't say anything. Just say better every day because it is better every day. Amen. So we talked about six hindrances and by recognizing these six hindrances to our faith and by renewing our mind with the word of God, we will cause our faith to increase. This is a hundred percent. It works every single time. It's us who fail the faith walk because we quit or we waver. 
every believer can see the promises of God come to pass in his or her life if we will take the time to meditate on who who he is in Christ, what we were saying, in him, who who I am in him, uh, what Christ did for me, who I am. If we'll take the time to meditate and what he has in Christ, what we have in Christ, and what he has in Christ, and act like God's word is true, we will have victory every single time. We have to recognize that we have authority. We can use the name of Jesus. We have to watch the words that are coming out of our mouth. We have to fight the good fight of faith. We win. That's the thing that we have to understand is we win all the time. But when we stop using our faith, when we stop uh, believing and confessing what we believe, that's when it all goes downhill. Get a hold of yourself and start doing what the Word of God says. Take these six hindrances and, and apply it and just say, okay, well, which one? All of them or maybe just one or maybe two or whatever. And go back and say, you know what? That, that one I need to pay attention to. This one I need to pay attention to. Get a hold of the Word and start acting on it. When we act on the Word of God, things happen. Amen? And if you don't know Jesus like we talked about, if you haven't received salvation, if you haven't received the new birth, if you haven't received all of that, you, it's a simple thing. You just need to say, Lord, that's me. God, I, I repent of my sins. I ask Jesus to come into my, my heart, be my Lord and Savior. I believe he's the Son of God. That's all it takes. If you say that, if you believe it in your heart, your whole life will change. You become born again. You're a new creation in Christ. You don't have to live the way you've been living. God works on the inside of you. But receiving Jesus, receiving salvation is the first step. So if you have just said that prayer and you could say it and you need to say it one time, you could say it and just respond in there, the live stream. If you've said it for the first time, then we'll get some information out to you. But being born again, receiving Christ into your heart is the greatest gift. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to clean yourself up. You just ask the Lord to come in and you believe. You believe what his word says. Amen? Amen? Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful, Lord. I pray for every single person, Father, that's, that's out there watching, Lord. I pray, Father, that you touch them in, in a way that they just can't help but go after you, Lord. Go after your word, Father. Seek you with all their heart, Father. I pray laborers will come across their path, Father. If they haven't receive salvation into their heart. I pray laborers are come across their path to tell them about you, Lord. We thank you for your word, Father. You're, you're always faithful. You're always good. You're always merciful. Your grace is never ending. We thank you, Father. We thank you for everything that is said and done here today, Father. To you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Have a good weekend.